This uh, um, lecture is being organized by the Oxford International Biomedical Center. So I'm going to introduce the president of that um, to introduce our speaker. Then after uh, the talk, there'll be a chance to ask questions, um, both from people here in Oxford and wherever you're watching uh, from around the world. For those who are watching virtually, please just uh, put your electronic hand up uh, in the system. And uh, if, you don't, if you can't find that, just put it in the chat that you've got a question and we'll uh, call on you. Um, but now I'll invite Charles Pasternak, the president of the Oxford International Biomedical Centre, to introduce our speaker, Charles. So this lecture is in commemoration of the life of Anne McLaren, a brilliant scientist who unfortunately died in a car crash just about 14 years ago. Uh, she was active in both the ethics and safety of intravenous IVF fertilization and conceived new pathways in embryology. She also conceived our host, president of Keller College, Professor Jonathan Mickey. Uh, and so now I'll pass on to Sir Walter Bodmer. You will have read some of his achievements uh, in the invitation. And he was actually the first professor of genetics to be appointed at Oxford in 1970. And I suspect partly to lure him over here from Stansford University where he was working. Those, some young, younger members of the audience of whom there are three here, but there could be many listening. Those of you who were undergraduates at Harford College will remember the inspiring leadership of Sir Walter when he was principal of Harford College. So that's all I want to say. Now, now it's a great pleasure to ask him to deliver his Anne McLaren Memorial Lecture on stem, stem cell therapy and the immune system. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. I have to say this is my first new experience giving a hybrid lecture. Maybe that's appropriate for geneticists, but I can wait. Uh, I should say it's a, it's a great honor and a pleasure to give this lecture in honor of, of Anne McLaren, who is really a great scientist, as I'm sure you know, and a wonderful person, and was also a great friend. And I think I first met her when I was asked by the British Association, as it was then called, to set up a committee to study the scientific, ethical, and legal implications of recent advances in genetics and biology. And I chaired that. And Anne was a member, and of course, that was very much uh, the sort of thing that she became interested in and very well known for promoting most effectively in getting the support for in vitro fertilization. That committee, incidentally, also included Bob Wynn, um, Edwards, who was got the Nobel Prize for uh, they were doing the first IPF. And uh, our paths crossed in, in many ways eventually. I mean, when she was president of the BA, I was vice president there. And I also noticed looking through my notes that actually she was very friendly with R.A. Fisher, who was my mentor with whom I did my PhD, uh, who used to um, provide him with mice. She used to provide him with mice for the experiments that, that they were doing. Uh, and another strange path, which was unpredictable, is she was actually taught genetics in Oxford by, by E.B. Ford, who had a personal chair. And I was his successor when they actually established genetics as a, as a proper subject here. And, and I also want to mention Donald Mickey, who's Jonathan's father. Um, I sought his advice and got to know him well for aspects of our computer development. And he was, of course, a founder in many ways of AI in this country and suffered a lot from Lighthill's rather damning, uh, and with faint praise, what AI could do it. I wonder what he'd think of what's going on now. Well, the talk I'm, I'm going to give uh, relates to some work I'm actually involved with, with a, a group in China, in Changsha, where there's a hospital that specializes in the human embryonic stem cells, which I'm going to talk about. Um, and they, they're quite remarkable. They do 40,000 IVFs a year at a, a, a very fine 
uh, Professor Rule, who's a noted figure in women's fertility issues, uh, who founded that hospital. So although this isn't primarily my field, I've, I've made it related to what I do in the, in the questions I'm going to pose. The question is really, how can one use the embryonic stem cells, which you can grow into tissues that you can then use uh, for the treatment of certain types of diseases, for example. Um, you can use cell therapy to replace cells in the pancreas that are no longer making uh, insulin. And how can you do that uh, and avoid the problem of transplantation of graft ejection, which I'm going to talk about, uh, which as you know, you can't just graft a bit of skin from one person onto another and expect it to survive because there are genetic differences that make that not work. So the question really that I'm ending up with is how can you try and get around that problem without making cells that are specific each time to the patient you're dealing with, which, which you could do through what's called induced polypotential stem cell production. So I want to start, and I'm going to take a point out that you can see this, uh, with this next slide. Now you might wonder what that is, but actually what that is, is that's a bit of skin being rejected on my arm by a very distinguished geneticist with whom I worked a lot with Jerry Trepolini. And you can see it just looks like a scar. And actually, to start with, it doesn't look that bad. It's being rejected. And it's being rejected because <coughs> I'm recognizing differences on the surface of the skin that's being put on my skin. And I mean, it's being rejected by the immune system. Now, the pioneer study in, in the, the rejection of grafts was Peter Medaway, a noted um, immunologist, Nobel Prize winner. And, and in a single paper in 1943 uh, with, with a clinician, Gibson, they did an experiment on, a, on a, a, a woman who had severe burdens and they <coughs> used skin from her as well as skin from her brother. Uh, and what they did is they had to put second time skin on. And when they put the skin from herself, it was fine and it grew. But when they put the skin on from the brother, it was very rapidly rejected in a way that we now recognize. Uh, and they said their conclusion was the breakdown of foreign skin epithelium, the cells of the skin that is, is brought about by a mechanism conforming to the general pattern of antigen antibody recognition. In other words, to the way that the immune system recognizes something foreign. So the question is, how can you recognize what that foreignness is? How can you find out what it is? And, and in order to introduce that, I, I, I want to remind you about the ABO blood groups. I'm sure most of you here and most of the people who are listening uh, online would have heard about the ABO blood groups. If you ever get a blood transfusion, you have to be matched for for ABO, and they were discovered by Landstein in 1900 because he found that certain people would have an antibody, as we now know it, in their blood, which when they got blood from a different type would, would coagulate, would cause um, clumping of the cells. So you can see there the cells are clumped and they're not. And, and that's just a simple way in which you can recognize the people <coughs> with an anti-A who've got either A or AB and so on. So the question you might ask is, is the difference just something like that? If you match for ABO, do you match for transplantation? And well, it, it turns out that actually you do need to match for that, but those really weren't the most important differences that matter. And that became obvious fairly soon. And one of the ways it became obvious is because Peter Meadow, again, uh, in this work, he showed that if you do experimental skin gaps in the rabbit, uh, and you take a rabbit skin and you take the donor from it, and then you take the cells, the white cells, the lymphocytes that are in the blood, and they will lead, if you give them after the initial skin, to an accelerated rejection, just like in that first patient I described. So that suggested that what one should be looking for was not differences on the red cells of the blood, but on the white cells, which makes sense because they should be differences that are most of the different cells in the body, including the skin cells. Uh, and so the next thing that people did is they said, well, let's try and look for antibodies that would clump or somehow recognize cells from different people in different ways 
uh, that might reveal what these differences, genetic differences are. Now, it, to, you, you might imagine if you get lots of blood transfusion, you're getting lots of white cells from lots of different people, that you make a variety of antibodies to the differences that many people have. And people had seen that you could get antibodies that would react with other people's white cells in that way. But it was too difficult to sort out because they would be responding to many, many genetic differences, as it turned out. So the way that, uh, in fact, one of, one of the people who first uh, resolved this problem, Rose Payne, with whom my late wife Julia and I worked on the early days of what's now called the HLA system, and Van Rood, another pioneer in that area, in 1958, uh, they realized that one should think of what happens a little bit like in rhesus. Now, if you've heard of rhesus uh, type, uh, if you're rhesus negative and you're a woman, and you have a husband who's rhesus positive and some of your offspring are rhesus positive, you make antibodies to that difference, and it's a difference on the red cells. And it was first recognized by a very severe disease, hemolytic disease of the newborn, that, that women get when they have second or further children, uh, that carry the rhesus D antigen when they don't have it themselves. So that suggests that maybe you could find the same sort of reactivity due to fetal maternal stimulation that was on the white cells rather than the red cells. And that's really how the whole system that I'm talking about was discovered by using antiseria that were produced by multiplicous women, women who had several pregnancies and had produced antibodies against the type that their husband would have had that was inherited by the fetus, but which they didn't have. And in that way, of course, you limit the range of differences to just the differences that would exist between the father and the mother. So the end result of that, with a lot of statistics, which I got involved in, that's how I got in this business, uh, was to define what turns out to be an extraordinarily complicated and variable genetic system. Uh, and I illustrate this here from the early days. So each of these letters and numbers is a type, something that you can say you're either A1 or you're A2 or you'll be something, um, one of these, uh, just by using these actors here and sorting out how they react with different things. And it was obvious from a, a very early stage that eventually there was an awful lot of these differences, not just three or four like in the ABO. Uh, and they fell into two categories one of which we call now HLA type 1, class 1, uh, which it comes from three different genes, three different uh, pieces of information on the chromosome that are close together. And they tend to be present on nearly all the cells of the body, not just the white cells. And then another set here, uh, which are another three genes, and they're all fairly close together. And they tend to be present on only the immune cells that function uh, in immune uh, responses, particularly making antibodies, rather than the cellular responses. And it's an important feature of this that all these genes are very close together on the chromosome. So they're inherited together as a collection. So it, when you want to match offspring, that's actually one of my sets uh, of, of six types that I carry on one of my uh, HLA regions, and the other one would be here. But there are only four possibilities. So I can be either this type or this type, and, and the mother can be either this or this. So you can only get four combinations, just as you would in a, in a normal genetic experiment. So actually, there's a chance of about a quarter of finding a sin who is an exact match to an individual, which is very important because it was through that that really the first clear indication that this was the system that we controlled. Careful injection. Uh, and this is early data from another pioneer in the field, Paul Terasaki, where he got together kidney transplant data. And what you're seeing here is the survival of a kidney graft when the, when the SIBs are not matched, when they're not identical. This is the survival over time when they are identical. There was a very striking difference. Uh, nowadays, of course, you could diminish that by using drugs would stop the immune response to any of the things. But this was really a very clear indication that here, these genetic differences were the ones that were the main differences that lead to rejection uh, of, of a graft. 
So I, I want to say a bit more about this and then how it relates to what I'm going to be talking about. Eventually, when you have identified uh, these differences, you can look at the chemistry uh, and you can work out using exotosmography, using techniques, what the structure of the actual molecule is that, on which you're detecting the, those differences. And it turned out it, it was a stunning piece of work because the structure uh, indicated almost immediately how this particular type of protein, this particular type of key product, uh, functioned in the immune system. It's made up of three chains, uh, two, two big two chains, which have different domains, so the different parts of them. So the main chain has an alpha part and one alpha two and an alpha three. And these, these two parts of the chain are, are sort of wound together in a way that leaves a groove here uh, into which fragments from uh, uh, produced within a cell, like fragments that may be produced by a virus, uh, can be loaded into that groove. And in addition to this main molecule, and most of the genetic differences are in the sequences of this part of the protein, uh, and this part is relatively constant, hardly varies. But there's another molecule that's very important called beta 2 microglobulin, which is associated with this. So you don't get a structure that works unless you put this bit together with this bit. That actually begins to be quite fundamental to what I'm going to be talking about. So well, although these types were not created, didn't evolve in order to frustrate transplant, surgeons, um, their, their main function turned out to be in the main way that the immune system works and recognizes foreigners. And just to give one example, which by now everybody knows about, because we've learned how it works in, in response to the coronavirus, which has been a very good exercise in how you teach people about immunology and genetics. So if you've got a cell here that's infected by a virus, the virus uh, eventually the components of the virus that will be broken into little bits, peptides, parts of the protein. And these get stuck in the way I've described onto the HLA molecule, the HLA class molecule. And only when that happens, and you've got the beta 2 microglobulin with it, do you get this combination expressed on the surface of the cell. And then in come the, the other cells, the lymphocytes, that can kill a cell once they recognize this difference. It's rather like an antigen, antibody antigen recognition of something foreign. And what they're recognizing is killing it. And that's a key feature of why that system has evolved in order to protect us uh, from infections. And that's one of the mechanisms, of course, in which uh, you get rid of virus infected cells. Although the main purpose of a, a vaccine is to produce antibodies which react in that way with the things on the surface of the cell. Uh, and they depend on the class two types of, of HLA uh, and, and not the class one. So that's a, a background to the way that the immune system works. Um, and the question now is really to ask, uh, how does that affect what we're talking about? The, uh, the response of the fetal maternal stimulation with respect to the rhesus difference leads uh, to damage and a serious disease. You might ask, well, if there are these antibodies that are produced against the white cells rather than the red cells, why don't they also lead, lead, lead to some diseases? Because they don't. About 20 to 50% uh, to of women who've had more than one child will have antibodies like that, that they produce during pregnancy, during the second or third pregnancy, that will react with the, with the fetus but it doesn't seem to cause damage. And you might ask, why not? And you might say in general, how can the fetus avoid being rejected? It's always carrying some of the genetic components in the father, which won't be present in the mother. They should be recognized as foreign. What is the mechanism that stops the fetus from actually being rejected as if it was a foreign gift? Because if that didn't happen, uh, you may be able to have children. On the other hand, you might say, uh, why did a system evolve that created that much difference that could create that problem 
And the answer is it's a balance between wanting to be sure that you can have living offspring, but also wanting to be sure that you can be protected from viral and, and other infections. And this conundrum of why one should try and understand how the fetus survives with the gel was again first clearly discussed by Peter Medawar, whom I've already mentioned in 1953. And he said the immunological problem of pregnancy may be formulated thus. How does the pregnant mother contrive to nourish within itself for many weeks or months a fetus that is an antigenically foreign body? In other words, why isn't it simply rejected because of the HLA differences? And that's really what I'm going to talk about next because it turns out to be a very interesting problem in which you have to think what happens at the earliest, earliest stages of development, something that Adam Klein, of course, was a pioneer in, in studying. So I want to then say something about, well, what are these early stages in development? And I've learned a lot from this. Many of you may know more about it than, than I do, depending on your background. But obviously, everything starts from the sperm and the egg getting together. And there's a period of time uh, within about six to 10 days from fertilization. When the cells, the, the egg, of course, fertilized egg divides, it produces a, a compacted set of cells that are called the blastocyst. And eventually uh, you find two forms of cell, cells form, an outer set of cells, which eventually form the trophoblasts. And the trophoblasts are the main cells of the placenta. And then you have the inner cell mass here, which are the cells that actually produce the fetus. And it's only later, about eight days or so, when you get what's implant, implantation, when that blastocyst, when that very early structure gets embedded into the epithelial layer in, 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 in the mother, uh, that you begin to get a more complex system. So <clears throat> what really matters is, is what, what happens in these early stages because you've got to protect those just as much as you have the later stages, when you've got already a lot of uh, placenta around the developing embryo. And of course, by the time you've got three months, you've got a fully developed um, uh, infant. And so the question is, what, what can, it's a simple explanation uh, by just looking at those tissues to see whether or not there's a mechanism that leads to no rejection. And so actually this, for us in my lab, when we were interested in HLA and its chemistry, we wanted to find a source of tissue that, from which you could easily make HLA molecules and study them. And the placenta was a very obvious source. It's a large tissue for a lot of stuff. It's mostly discarded. And you might say, well, if that has HLA, that would be great. You could make it from that. And in fact, Van Roon, who was a pioneer I mentioned in this field, uh, claimed he could do that. Well, we tried to, and after a little working, we found well that placenta actually, the way we isolated, didn't have any of that HLA. So the simple answer might be, well, it might just be that the surface that's in touch with the maternal system lacks the HLA class one molecules that would cause a rejection. And early uh, results, a number of people looked at this in different ways, uh, showed that that was true. So this is actually from a student of mine, Paul Travers, who, who worked a lot in this area. Uh, and he was looking at a term perceptor, so quite late now, not at the early stages. And he was staying with an antibody that would be one of the first or the clonal antibodies, as they call them, it says on your side, that actually reacts with all the HLA class one, all those class one molecules. And if you look here, these are the cells of the placenta. And the staining here is if it's darkly stained like here, then you've got a positive reaction. And if it's not stained here, you've got a negative reaction. And that showed fairly directly that the placenta, as we were looking at there, didn't actually express any class one. So that suggested that maybe that really is the mechanism by which you, you avoid rejection. Now, we all were, also were studying uh, an enzyme, cyclarcholine phosphatase, an enzyme a gene product that happens to be quite specific to the placenta. We're working with that a lot now because it's interesting because it's expressed in many cancers and when it is, it's highly cancer specific. And in that case, you can see the placenta stains quite well, but the other cells 
which are fetal cells, um, don't stain. And that's because of the specificity. And, and just to confirm this result, um, we studied at the same time, there's a type of tumor that actually is derived from the dopamine, from the cells that make the placenta. It's a rare type of tumor. And you could show, and there are cell lines, and you can study in, in the laboratory, and one of them is this one. So if you look at the reaction of this cell line with this uh, antibody, it doesn't express these HLA types. Whereas this is just a, another source of cell, a lymphoid cell that is normal and expresses it, and that's what you get from the control antibody. So there seem to be no doubt that at least some class of the tofoblasts, which are in uh, contact with the maternal circulation, were not expressing class one. And that could be uh, a major reason why uh, the fetus is not injected uh, as, as a graft. And indeed, with a, with a former student of mine, uh, we concluded in a short note to the Lancet, 1978, the simple idea is it therefore seems most probable that the lack of immunogenicity of the total blast with respect to cellular immunity, that means with respect to the killing you get from cells rather than antibodies, rather than the depression of the maternal immunocompetence, that would have nothing to do with stopping the mother from having a proper functioning immune system, is the primary mechanism involved in the immunological inertia of the reparity that could be rather fast. Basically, the idea was that it's just a lack of expression of those class one types on the on the turfoblast, which is what's immediately in contact with the maternal uh, system that actually prevents rejection. Well, but as always happens in these sorts of studies, nothing is ever quite that simple. Uh, and the complexity was that first of all, there are several different types of turfoblasts. Uh, and people later showed that maybe uh, it was only one subset of tympoblasts that didn't express this class one, and others did. And the second problem is, in addition to those three types that I mentioned, A, B, and C, people found two other types that were very similar, expressed in the same way, called G and E, that seem to have different functions. And in particular, whereas the A, B, and C were all very variable, so they cause all that variability that leads to rejection. The G was not very bad. So one suggestion was maybe the G substitutes for the A, B, and C and gives you some protection um, <coughs> against infections, for example, uh, when, when the A, B, and C are not there. So that, that leads to really looking into more detail what, what can one say about the cell types that are actually present during those very early stages and then develop during the later stages uh, of development. And this, <coughs> this is taken from a recent paper um, <coughs> that, that discusses these issues. Uh, and th this is what I've been talking about. When you initially have, the, these are the outside tofoblasts and the inner cell mass, you've got this ball of cells that's just sticking to the epithelial cells in the uterus. And then eventually, when you get implantation, they dig in there and then you produce, you have a much more intimate connection with the maternal system, which is where you might expect to get more problems with an immune response. And that's illustrated here that you actually get um, extravillous tophoblasts, as they're called. You get different types of tophoblasts. You get some tophoblasts that are on the outside. You get some that seem to have more function. And then you get these that are ones that seem to be largely involved in making sure that the fetus gets the nourishment that it has to from the maternal circulation. It gets it by absorption of oxygen and, and nutrients. There's some, some molecules that can get through the system of cells and the membranes that are there, but mostly not. And so you do have a physical protection uh, between the contact between the cells of the fetus and the cells of the mother. So the question is, uh, where do you get some of these other um, other types of total mass expect, expressing uh, these other antigens? So there's, a, there's really a very, a lot of the work has been done either with term percentage, it depends on human material, obviously, 
how, how much you can get access to the sort of material you want to study at very early stages. And a lot of the early stages, the early abortions, six to eight weeks, by which time you've really lost the distinction of what's happening at those very early steps. And there's a recent paper just published about two years ago in PNAS, which was the first paper when I looked through all of this that really seemed to give information that was relevant to understanding exactly what's happening at these very early stages. Because if you don't have some protection, even before you get the implantation at this stage, you've still got these cells exposed to the maternal system that could lead to rejection. So while later on, you may develop other mechanisms in a more complex system in which you escape the effects of the maternal immune system. To start with, you're just there and you're in contact with it and there's nothing you can do about it. So actually what this, it's interesting this paper is the day, it uses the techniques now where you can look at signal cells, you can find out what they're making, so you can get a much closer idea of really what's going on with lots of different cell types. But rather than in the main body of the paper, which I thought did a lot of analysis that wasn't all that interesting, I looked into the supplementary information. And finally, I found one figure in that which really gave me the answer that I wanted to find. It's only in the supplementary information. And that's what I'm showing here. And you might say, well, why is that so interesting? Well, first of all, they were able to get cells from very early stages, day eight, day 10, and day 12 after, after fertilization. So they were really looking, it's only by about this time that you start getting the implant, uh, implantation. So um, what, what they find, these, these are symbols for different types of turfoblasts, so the B is for turfoblasts. Um, and what they found, if you just, without worrying too much about the different cell types, they found in these early stages, there was no HLA at all. They didn't, I'm just really, showing C there, that C for various reasons is present in later stages. But these early stages, you didn't get G, you didn't get E, and you didn't get A, B, and C. So in theory, the very earliest stages, it still are protected because they like the class one. And it's when you get to later stages and those extra villas turfoblasts that have a lot to do with, with how the fetus gets its nourishment, uh, that you have some of these other HIV types on those cells. And this is a staining, and it's an interesting staining. The staining against this HLA gene, this new class one type, which, which has a slightly different structure and function uh, than the ones that, that we mostly think about when we're matching for transplantation. But you see, when you stain it, you get all the stain, the expression, and on the outside, not in the inside. So that the HLA gene is the dominant expression. Uh, together with some C, and that's an interesting question. It means extra villas So really what you're getting, I've tried to simplify it, hope I got it about right, is when you get the very early turfoblasts, up to eight or 10 days, they're all class one negative, and they really do seem to be protected from the maternal immune system, simply by those types not being there. There's nothing to react to. And then as you go to the later stages, called syncytial, um, yeah, mostly they remain class one negative. And then it's only when you get this later stage that you still have the, the A and the B negative, that you get these others expressed. And it turns out that these others are something to do uh, with the way that the placenta develops, the way the nutritional side happens. The HLAG seems to have something to do with what's called spinal artery growth. That's the growth of the arteries from the mother uh, that provide the oxygen that's needed by the fetus. Um, and, and there's a balance between the maternal immunity and the fetal immunity. So you may all be uh, familiar with the fact that you would not give a vaccine to a child unless it's about three months old. And that's because it takes that period of time for the immune system to mature. Uh, but there is an interrelationship still as the, the, even in the fetal stage, and certainly in the early um, <coughs> stage after birth, in which you have to get, actually the mother's immune system has to protect the offspring because it can't yet do it itself. 
So there has to be a, an evolution of, of, of a balance between the fetal and the maternal system. And these other HLA types and there's some other cells involved seem to be doing that. So it's a, it's a, it's a more complicated situation that develops as the development uh, of the fetus uh, develops. So the question is, what's the relevance of all of that? And what I'm supposed to be talking about. And namely, what, what's the relevance of it uh, to the problem of, of um, human embryonic stem cell uh, use for, for dealing with diseases? So the question is, what, what really are human embryonic stem cells? So my next slide is taken actually from the Wikipedia, which often has very good, nice diagrams to educate people. I find it very useful. And the idea is, is in, in principle, straightforward. Is if you can grow cells in culture, establish them so you can use them as a continuously growing cell culture from this inner cell mass, they can be what's called pluripotent. They are the cells that are not yet differentiated into different cell types. And by culturing them in various ways, you can produce cells that will circulate in the blood system, the nervous system, the immune system, cells of the pancreas. There's a huge amount of that work being done. So it's through taking those cells and turning them into tissue cells that you can use for providing cells that can deal with diseases where some tissue has gone wrong. I mean, an obvious one to mention again is diabetes, but and the pancreas cells don't make insulin. That's when you get diabetes. So can you put back cells uh, that, that provide the insulin uh, using this sort, sort of an approach? And, 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 but the, the same problem then arises. These cells will carry the antigens of the fetus. And clearly, if they do, they're going to be rejected. So you can't just give something that you grow from an embryonic stem cell, differentiate it uh, to, to a patient. If it's going to be rejected, just like a cat, even more so than the fetus, there's nothing to protect it from that immune response. Uh, and so you've got to find ways uh, of, of getting around that problem. Now, there is a, a way, as I mentioned right at the beginning, in which you can get these differentiated cells from the patient themselves. You can turn some of their cells into what are called IPS cells, which have some of these properties. But that's a very long and complex process if you do it for each patient. And it's not clear that those cells will behave as well as what you would get from using a two embryonic stem cell. Um, so the question is, how do you deal with that? Well, uh, the, the first attempts, and there have been successful attempts, we're, we're dealing with providing um, pigment cells for the eye. Uh, and in particular for dealing with what's called age-related macular degeneration, which you may be familiar with, where you really get loss of vision because the pigment epithelium that functions just to create, it doesn't work properly anymore. And the idea is, can you replace it? And the reason for choosing the eye to start with, because the eye is somehow protected from the immune attack. It's a protective environment, and that's been known for a long time because you can do corneal grafts from one person to another without rejection if you're careful about it. Uh, and so it's, it's a protected environment. And so the assumption was that therefore, if you make uh, pigment uh, epithelial cells, the ethanol pigment epithelial cells, maybe they would work even if there is that HLA difference. And that has been done quite successfully to a limited extent with clinical trials. But it still requires the use of immunosuppressive drugs, drugs that suppress the immune response. So it's not a complete answer. So with, with uh, my, my colleagues in, in Chengshan, we formulated an approach that we thought might provide an answer to dealing with this, which is uh, along the lines that have been widely looked at. So the first of all, just to remind you what you do, you get the human embryonic stem cells. This is from um, Dai Zhu, a colleague of mine in Chang uh, And the process is that you, you incubate these and it takes quite a long time. Uh, and you often add different key substances that stimulate the development. And in this case, at the end, you get these cells that are very characteristic of what are known to be uh, epithelial cells. And these are various stains that show that. 
so you can produce these cells. So what they've done is they've taken one of their 600 embryonic stem cell lines of known HLA type uh, as a starting point for doing an experiment. And what's the approach we use? Well, this you'll see is, is my version of doing a slide. It's not quite as good as other people's. So the idea there in principle is straightforward and merely depends on all the knowledge I've been telling you about, about the HLA system and how it works. So you start with the embryonic stem cell and it has its HLA types. It's got two types um, of the A's and it's got two types of the B's and it will all have C's that are expressed. And, and if they are expressed in that way, if they're present, they will undoubtedly lead to rejection. But they depend on the presence of this other molecule, beta 2 microglobulin, which is part of the essential structure of that molecule. So the simple answer is, why don't we just knock out beta 2 microglobulin? When you do that, we've done that sort of experiment years ago, for instance, in other experimental systems, you get no class one on the surface. And people have thought of doing that. And they thought of then putting in HLAG because it's not very problematic. But uh, I think there are problems with that. If you have cells that have no class one, they tend to be attacked by a type of cell called an HK cell because the body doesn't like to have cells that have no HLA class one. And in fact, in general, uh, they could in principle be dangerous because if they produce a tumor, uh, then you've got no way of the immune system trying to react against it. And also, if you've got cells that have no HLA class one, they're going to be susceptible to viral and other infections. So the idea was this, uh, it's a very simple one. You say, all right, we'll knock out beta 2 f And you get to a cell that doesn't have any of those HLA types. But then what you can do, you can knock in the H2H2 A2 molecule in which it's covalently, it's linked to beta 2 m So if you put in that combination, there's no free beta 2m in the cell. The only thing that will be expressed is A2. Now you might ask why A2 when you've got a match for A2. Well, probably at least half of you in this Zoom get the hint. It's the commonest HLA type of all. And here you can see the relative frequencies of the antigen uh, in, in a typical British population. You see A2 is, is, is quite frequent. In fact, it's the type that was discovered initially by my late wife the first analysis you ever did looking for HLA types. And it's the most widely used study. It's also built with reagents that can be M2. So if you choose A2 as the thing you can look at, and you've got a match, you can already match for 30 or 40 percent of most of the world's population. And what you, once you know that that works, when you can say, well, instead of using A2, we can use A1. Or if you go to East uh, Asian populations, Chinese, uh, A24 is very common. So just by doing this with, with a couple of, of HLA types, you might be able to match the differences for virtually anybody in the population. Uh, and there's another interesting feature, which I just heard a talk about the other day by Timaniuk, who's just come as Professor, Professor Julie, um Oncology, that actually the A2 type is particularly good at recognizing lots of differences. Uh, different types of viruses. So you, you're getting a, a, a protection that might be nearly as good as a normal protection. So anyway, that's what we're working towards. And just to give you a little bit of real data on this, um, not all of you, there's something called fluorescence activated cell sorting. Essentially, it's a way if you've got fluorescent antibodies, antibodies that have, give you different colors on your tissues, uh, of seeing what's expressed. So if you take T cells that would normally have both HLA and then therefore beta 2M on the surface, you see that that difference is the level of expression. That means that these cells are reacting with those two sorts of antibodies. Uh, and the difference here is a measure of how much they're reacting. So when you get the human embryonic stem cell line that was used as a starter, you can see that that is expressing both class one and class two. It may have rather less than normal cells, but as soon as it differentiates, it's going to have pretty well the normal level. And so that's the retinal pigment epithelial cells derived from that. And as you see, they're both expressing quite normal, reasonable levels of class one. So if you just use those uh, to teach, they, they'd be rejected. So uh, this, I think, is my last slide. Uh, it's got just before what we really want to do in the end. 
So here you can see that if you stay with this beta 2m, which is the one you're knocking out, it's there in the normal one, but in these are different examples of knocking out. You can, you can knock it out completely. Uh, and we know that when you knock it out, it can still differentiate. So that we think is, is one way to get around this problem of, of the rejection of the cells that you can make from human embryonic stem cells when you want to do cell therapy. We haven't yet done the insertion of the other type. I think that's just a matter of time and, and, and money. So uh, you can wait for the next exciting episode for that. That's the end of my talk. Thank you. So uh, we're now going to, Professor Wagner is going to take questions from the live audience and from the live but distant audience. Anyone from the uh, distant audience? Why don't we start with the ones here? Start with the ones here, okay. Well, there must be some that. questions. Any live audience? Yes. yes. Um, thanks, Sir Walter, for like, taking us through, as, as you just mentioned, almost 100 years of, of, of well, maybe not quite that much, 50 to 60 years of. of 50 or 60 years. Yeah, yeah. Of, that, that still allows me to be involved. Very impressive. Um, I, I guess my question is what excites you right, right at this moment in time um, in this area of research and going forward? So, what's the most exciting thing you're seeing on the horizon and, and the most promising going forward? I think there are a number of situations. To look like genetic engineering when you're replacing uh, an alpha human gene, but you can do the same with replacing it uh, essentially by a, a cell that does the function that you want to have done. Um, because, and I think that's going to have a lot of potential. I mean, the most obvious application is the diabetes, which of course is a huge problem, whether it's type 1 or type 2, you can imagine it could be used there. Of course, there's been a lot of attempts to do judgments and pancreas and pancreas and cells and so on. And it's really not completely satisfactory. I mentioned the ethanol at the beginning. Although um, they had some success, they still had to use uh, immunosuppressive drugs. And they have unpleasant side effects. And so I think if you could avoid that by doing the approach that they're doing, that that would be an advantage. Um, then you can be more ambitious with a lot of diseases of the liver. And the liver is not a terribly structure in many ways. It may be that you can replace. The normal cells of the liver that you could do things like. So I think there are going to be a whole range of possibilities. Um, in, in some of the more common diseases, the genetic engineering where you're trying to put in a gene that doesn't function is more specialized, and often each situation occurs with a much lower frequency. Good evening, Walter. How very nice uh, to see you, and thank you ever so much for an extremely clear exposition of um, a, a classic old problem, uh, the solution to which still needs to be found, I think. Thank yeah. you very much. And, and greetings to, to you, Charles, my old tutor from Worcester College. Uh, I'm so delighted to see you there. Total surprise and, and, and glorious. Thank you. Um, so, so my question, I'm sorry, I'm such a slow typist that I'm afraid I only got it in after you'd opened the, the, the little surprise. Um, so my question was, um, what, what would happen to a tissue or an organ that might develop from um, uh, an initial cell transplant derived from ES cells that were expressing only HLA-A2 and no other class one alleles? Do you think there might be a, a disadvantage of some sort that they might suffer? Well, I, I think it might not be as good as if they had everything else. Uh, but I think it's a lot better than having nothing. <laughs> well, yes, uh, I agree. When you, when you think of it, in the end, uh, it's, it's individual HLA types that give you uh, the ability to respond to a viral infection. It's particular epitopes on the virus that do that. So, and especially since, as Tineli very elegantly spoke about it the other day, um, you get a huge range of responses for A2 that is much broader than some of the other alleles. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably why it's, it's more prevalent throughout the world. That makes sense. So yeah. my, my, my guess is that you'll do a, a lot better by putting A2 in there than if you had nothing there. Now, time will tell how, how much that matters. Mm -hmm. my, 
my gut feeling, if I can put it that way, uh, <laughs> is that I think I think it's going to be important to do that. I just wondered if are, are there any animal studies on that because it, it, it should be not difficult to model in mice not, or rats or something. Not, not yet, but, but years ago in the experiments we did with Andrew McMichael, we took a um, <coughs> we took a, a colonic epithelial tumor cell which had beta two microglobulin mutations in it, and and we put in A two, and it certainly can respond perfectly normally uh, to T cells. Um, uh, that, uh, <clears throat> that when it's given the appropriate peptide, say a flu peptide. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there's every reason to suppose that that will work. Um, whether it will work as well as it, it presumably won't work as well as if everything else was there. Otherwise, we wouldn't have all those other HLA types. Exactly. Uh, it's still going to be a lot better than nothing. Uh, I'd accept that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, you think that's it? Okay, once yeah. more, thank you very much.